without a will. So John passes away. Question number one that we will have is did John make a will? And that, we would, that will be part of the research when you're doing succession work. The law says if the person didn't execute a will, then in book four we can find the rules and regulations that tell us, okay, these persons will be the heirs. If you say, well, that's not what I want, I don't, I don't, you have to get advice. Say, well, that's not what I want. I don't want this, this person or these persons to inherit from me. Then you must make a will. So what we call uh, an estate without a will, we call it ab interstate. Ex testamento is with, an, uh, with a will. So now the situation again. So John passes away, didn't, didn't draft a will, didn't execute a will. Then we need to know who are his heirs. And the law tells us, gives us the guidelines and says, well, we're going to look at the legal family ties. We're going to look at a group of heirs. And there are four groups. And we always start with group number one, or A, as it's mentioned here. Group number A is spouse and children spouse and or children. If, we, if there is a spouse, John was married, or even if John wasn't married but had children, then we know, okay, that's the group. We found the persons, we need to ask them, are you accepting the estate? They need to know, of course, what they're accepting, yes or no. And uh, the spouse and children, John has, uh, John has a, a wife and children, they will inherit the estate for an equal share. That's what the law says. <coughs> John wasn't married, John didn't have children. Second group, then we look at parents and siblings. Did John leave behind any, his father and his mother? Or only his father, only his mother and brothers and sisters. That's the second group. If we can't find anybody in the second group, then you're gonna look at group number three. That is the grandparents. Okay, no grandparents and no uncles, no aunts, no uh, uh, yeah, distant cousins. Then we go to the last group, and that, that last group is the group of the great-grandparents. And what in every group, in every single group, so John has a wife, John has children, in every single group, you will find what they call representation, plaats vervulling. A representation means that if, for instance, one of John's children has predeceased John, that the grandchildren can get John's share. To give you an example, John passed away, wife, three children, that means that um, wife and all the children are each equally entitled to one-fourth of the estate. But let's say one of the children predeceased has make it two children, then these two children are entitled to that one-fourth. So we don't add up. I've had that question a couple of times over the years. Oh, um, does that mean that now we have, uh, we, we add on the people, we just divide by the number of people that are there? No, it still, it still uh, depends on how you relate it to the deceased. So now when it comes to estate planning versus uh, inheritance, the question is, and what is there to inherit? So the parents have property and they want to make sure maybe 
they say one one of the one of the motivations for parents to draft a will is they say you know what I don't want a discussion I have lot one two and three and I know the eldest gets lot one the middle one gets lot two and the youngest one gets lot three well that's a very easy uh, example and that's that you can call estate planning that they say they draft a will and they put those wishes into effect um, in that will. So for, for estate planning, as I mentioned before, you have to make your inventory. What do you do with that estate? I always think I'm very funny, so I put to will or not to will. That is the question. Yeah. So who inherits the estate of the deceased? That's the questions you ask yourself when you're going over your personal, your personal situation. Okay, I have this. Who does the law say is going to get it? Do I like that? Yes or no? That's what estate planning boils down to. Are there minors involved? Important questions. When the question that I put, when does one obtain possession? It's also possible some parents may say, I have a house, um, I'm alone, I'm a, a single parent, and I have a, a daughter, and she's five. I would like to put the house in my daughter's name. And it depends very much on the individual situation, whether we will advise for or advise against. The client has the last say, obviously. But there are situations where we say, but. Uh, let's say it's a mother, father, so we tell the parent, are you sure? The child is five, um, you don't know, this might be the only asset that you have, you don't know if you're going to need this yourself for medical reasons later that you may have to sell it, it might be your only uh, type of income for pension later in life, are you sure? So those are questions we ask. Because there's, there's a lot you can arrange with the last will, that you make sure that it goes to the child. Another thing that for parents is uh, very important, uh, let's say you, you, you say, I want to donate it to my son. Always negotiate. Well, you don't have to negotiate. You say, I, this, is, this is how you get it. Take it or leave it. You make sure that you arrange a usufruct a lifelong right of use of work so that you can stay in the property as long as you live. So the children can't say, thank you for the gift. Um, I've seen you enough. To the loo. <laughs> Another important question to ask. I close my eyes. Who's going to represent my estate? Especially, I don't have, but what if I have 12 children? That's a large group of people. And... Uh, I think we all know already if you have, the moment you have one more person at the table, <laughs> it becomes uh, difficult sometimes. 12 people, that's a lot of opinions. And that can, that can make it difficult, impractical, if things need to be dealt with at the tax office, at the SZV, at the bank. So the advice would be start thinking about an executor, somebody who can represent the estate. The executorship, I want to underscore that as well, is a temporary job. That's not a job you take on and say, okay, for the next 20 years, I'm the executor of the estate. Your job is to make sure that the will is executed as soon as possible. And there are different type of executorships, different type of ways in which the executorship is worded in a last will. So those are very important questions to ask yourself, what do I want? So going to the last will more in detail. Just a little bit about a will. A will is personal. You cannot come to me, husband and wife, arm in arm, sit down and say, we want one document. And uh, it's not going to save you money. <laughs> no, a will is personal. That means the husband has a will, the wife has her own will. Very important aspect. The will is revocable. Spouses make a will by me. Next week, one of the spouses changes the will to benefit the dog. I'm just saying something. <laughs> I cannot tell the other partner, sorry, you've been replaced by the dog. 
So it's, 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 it's revocable. So sometimes when you're talking with people about how do we arrange matters, that's also a point that we touch on because there's a lot you can arrange, for instance, in, in a marriage contract. And the word marriage contract, prenuptial agreement, who looks forward? The word contract says already, it's two persons agreeing to certain conditions. A will is a one-party declaration that's revocable. But, based on love and trust, I don't want to dismiss that, one should be able to make such arrangements through wills. Who can make a will? You must be 16 years of age and older, you must be compass mentis, you must be okay, okay upstairs. Um, that's a difficult topic. Number one, I mean the easiest is if somebody is of a certain age, you start doubting, you get a little bit more uh, careful. And guidelines are that you ask for the person to bring a compass mentis decoration from the house doctor. That is, that is one of the requirements that, that can be asked uh, of uh, the person who's executing the will. The form, most common notarial deed. In situation of war, you can make also on the certain, uh, the, the other manners in which you can make a will. Um, there is there is a possibility of a handwritten, signed, dated will that then has to go in an envelope, go to the notary, then the notary has to make a, a deposition document, and and uh, if you revoke it and you forget to pick it up, it wasn't actually revoked, or or or, <laughs> and all those type of consequences. So uh, commonly. Most common is that you come to the notary office, we give you advice, we draft it, you review it, and it's executed. Again, I underscore it's revocable, but I also underscore it for the reason of the importance of people starting to think about last wills at much earlier ages. Um, it's very difficult if you are already very sick, you are in the hospital, and yeah, you're drugged up. That's what it boils down to. You can't communicate, the family knows, you told them in beforehand, yeah, I want to draft a will, I want to draft a will. By the time the notary reaches there, the person can't express his or herself. And then the notary will turn around and leave, and you will not have executed that will. It's not possible, you have to be able to to, to express yourself. And because it's revocable, you advise at any rate, let's say uh, you, you draft a will today, every three to five years, take a look at your document. Make sure it still uh, complies with your situation. Maybe you had another child. Maybe you divorced. Maybe you this. Maybe you that. Take a look at it. And maybe you make your changes, yes or no, depending on the situation. It's revocable. So it's not... It's not binding until the day you close your eye. In the testament, what can we arrange? Lots of fun stuff. Bequests, those are gifts. You can gift, for instance, $1,000 to the Red Cross, your church, a good friend. Those are gifts. The person who obtains a bequest or is is not an heir to the estate. That person becomes a creditor to the estate. So this is a person, let's say the Red Cross, can, come, can go to the heirs and say, well, I would like to receive my $1,000. Appointment of heirs, very logical. Yeah, who would I like to appoint as my heirs? But you will also find last wills where we don't mention an appointment of heirs. Why? Because the client is happy with how book four arranged whom are going to be his or her heirs, but just needs other types of arrangements like guardianship and uh, administration. 
two-step clause. That is a, is, is a clause that makes it possible you appoint one heir. This heir um, has, uh, has, uh, th this heir has uh, all the freedom in regards, well, within certain boundaries, all the freedom in regards to the property that this person is inherited, but you dictate in advance that if that person again, that heir, passes away, that you appoint the following heir. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not part of the last will or estate of your first mentioned heir. And that, that for instance, is used in situations. Um, I'm recently divorced, I have uh, children, and I don't want, and they're young for instance, I don't want that in the situation that I die, my children inherit from me, they die, that it would end up by my ex-husband just to give you an example, yeah? Then you can use those type of clauses. That is one reason uh, to do so. Sometimes the reason is to keep it in a certain line, family line. You know, I, I really, really don't want, uh, I, I really don't want uh, the wife to get it in any way, shape or form, yeah? That's a possibility. Obligations versus requests. Now, obligation, testamentary obligations are binding, and uh, there are certain penalties if you don't adhere to them. For instance, if I'm donated a home with the obligation to uh, donate $1,000 to the Red Cross uh, once a year, I don't do so. The Red Cross can take me to court, and I might lose the house. So it's, that's a serious, serious matter, an obligation. Requests? No, those are moral. Those are moral obligations. I request my children to try to keep the property in the bloodline, for instance, because the law says you're not allowed to tell your children you're not allowed to sell. I've had that request too. I don't want them to sell it ever, I hear. It's not allowed. You cannot do that. So you can obviously put a request. So I would appreciate it if you didn't sell it unless necessary for medical reasons, further, further education, those type of things. Executorship, I mentioned it already. Very important, very important that, uh, that we all start thinking more and more about appointing an executor, who's going to take care of the matters, who's going to make sure uh, that all the taxes are paid, make sure uh, that uh, all the bills are paid, make sure that all the subscriptions are terminated, and, um, make sh and then on a silver platter, hand over the estate to the heirs for them to decide how to divide. The executor doesn't decide the division. The executor, I call it, does the cleanup job. Private asset clause, that's an interesting one since we also, from the 1st of April 2014, um, had another change in the law, which is, well, I, I like it. It says that if I, whether I inherit a property before I get married or whilst I'm married in community of assets, in the event of divorce, that house is not part of the conversation. That's not in the entire kingdom the same. I think in the Netherlands they probably want to change it as, as well to that direction, Aruba. So that's why we still recommend, we still recommend uh, uh, often parents to include a clause like this in their will, that in the event of the divorce of their children or whatever, whichever beneficiary, that they don't have to share it with an ex-husband or ex-wife. Appointment guardian. As long as both parents are there, in the situation of uh, parents who are married, children born from marriage, they both have parental authority. And I'll touch on that topic as well. If you're not married and you have a, a child together, and as a father you acknowledge the child, that doesn't give you parental authority. Parental authority you can only obtain if both parents go to court and file a petition for joint parental authority. 
So that means even though you acknowledge your child, you have your legal obligations towards your child, besides the moral already, um, in principle, you don't decide which school the kids goes to, which, uh, if whether it's vegetarian uh, or not, uh, what it uh, wears, and has, yeah, officially, uh, when it's traveling, uh, the other parent can decide. So that's to touch on the, the, the matter of uh, parental authority. Guardianships, okay, married situation, both parents pass away. Children are still a minor. Where are the children going to? Who's going to take care of the children? Yeah? If you don't stipulate that in a will, the judge will be placed for that difficult decision of making that choice. The judge is not going to know your family. It's not going to know, oh, this aunt is better than, you know, better equipped than that uncle. And you have situations, I've, I've had clients who say, my sister, fantastic, I, we agree completely on the manner of education, so I would like to appoint my sister as a guardian, but, oh, bit of a hole in her hand, I would like for my other sister to be appointed as administrator, which is the next, uh, next point on uh, the list. So when you're talking about guardianship, you're talking about somebody who's going to take care of your child, who's going to manage, as, as, as a parent, manage the assets of the child until the child is 18, and then it ends. Now you say, but wait a second, Oof, I am filthy rich, I have a problem. I don't trust the kids with so much money, or so many assets. I'm, so, I'm afraid they'll uh, go through it, Two, three years is done. It's Monaco for racing and uh, name it. Am I still within my 20 minutes? New inheritance law. I hope everybody has heard it. But for April 1st, April Fool's Day 2014, we have a new inheritance law. And there are some differences. And the fact that we have a new inheritance law does not mean that the old law is not of importance. Yes, it remains of importance because we have many estates, many estates, with persons who passed away before April 1st, 2014. And the old law still dictates how the inheritance is handled for those estates. So when we talk about new inheritance law, we're talking about those estates that uh, of, of those persons who pass away starting from April 1st, 2014. Now, main differences, well, some of it's a bit academic, a bit boring, less group of heirs. Um, this one is very important, substitution allowed in all the groups. Substitution, I don't know if anybody remembers, I mentioned it earlier. Substitution me means um, I have an heir, I have an heir, a child, let me see, me, I have a child, but when I pass away, the child has predeceased me. That child has child, had children, automatically, by substitution, those children replace my deceased child. That's substitution. And substitution is in all the groups, uh, it applies. The entire inheritance law is based on, we need the assets to go down, yeah, down the generations. But there are certain alarm bells that go off um, that at least we need to hear when we're talking about uh, substitution. Because the moment we disclaim an estate, so a family member passed away, I could be an heir, I was, a, I was appointed uh, in, in, in the will. And, uh, no, sorry. Um, my parents uh, pass away, I'm one of the children, and uh, I say, I, no, I hereby uh, refuse the inheritance. Then, maybe without me knowing, my children will get my part of the estate. And sometimes that's desirable because I, that's what I want. I would like for the estate to go straight to them. Sometimes that's undesirable. I've had those situations as well, where there's a group of heirs and uh, the intention is that a 
part of that group stays with the estate, another part already had received uh, uh, properties in the past. So that's very, very important when, uh, to watch out when you're planning to disclaim or refuse an inheritance, the consequence. And uh, also disinheriting an heir. I have 12 children, 11 of them are lovely, but there's this one, can't tell you what happened, terrible. And I definitely don't want this heir, this child, to inherit from me. So I can disinherit the child. Could be that we haven't spoken in 30 years. If, if I don't mention specifically in the will, I disinherit this child and his or her descendants, I have a problem potentially. At least I'm dead. <laughs> the others will have a problem. Then these, these grandchildren from this, that I may have not seen in the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years as well, suddenly pop up and say, hey, we're here to uh, claim uh, our, uh, our father's or our mother's uh, part in the estate. So I'm just saying it, so you know, I put it in red because it's very important. One of the main differences between the old law and new law, and, uh, and uh, I was I was and I'm still very excited about it, thank you Parliament, is the abolishment of the legitimate portion. Now you really have full control of your estate. Under the old civil code, uh, it was difficult, almost impossible to disinherit children. If you disinherited one or more children, they had a right to still claim a certain percentage, percentage sorry, of your estate. We call that the legitimate portion. But under the new civil code, I can disinherit these children and they, don't, they, they cannot come back and claim a share in my estate. Practically the only tool I can think of that they might still have is try to prove that I was mentally ill when I disinherited uh, him or her.